All right, welcome everyone. Today we are going to be talking about the axial skeleton. Uh, so this is just part one of the skeletal system. So last time we talked all about bone tissue and how uh, bone tissue and bones uh, develop and grow, how they heal um, and all of that. And then today uh, we're gonna start with chapter seven. So it's a huge chapter and we're gonna cover half of that, which is the axial skeleton. So we'll talk a little bit about what is the axial skeleton first versus the appendicular skeleton. So what makes up the axial skeleton, what makes up um, the appendicular skeleton. And then we'll really get into the crux of it, which is going to be the skull, so all of our skull bones, as well as the vertebral column, so all of the vertebrae. Um, what's the difference between the different vertebrae? and then about the ribs and their attachment, so um, the rib cage, right? And then just at the end, we always do a little bit of disorders of the axial skeleton and the development of the axial skeleton. All right, so what is the skeleton? What does it consist of? So we know the skeletal is a system, right? So it's an organ system. So we have a couple different um, tissues, right? So all of our uh, connective tissues are making up the skeleton. We've got bone tissue, cartilage, um, ligaments, joints. And then we also, we're gonna have a whole lecture on joints, but we also call joints articulation. So if you see that word, um, that's gonna always refer to a joint. So we split up the entire skeleton into the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So the axial skeleton is only made up of the skull, the vertebrae, and the thoracic rib cage thoracic cage how, however you want to call it okay and so therefore the appendicular skeleton is going to be made up of the pectoral and pelvic girdles which are you know our shoulders and hips which is what you refer to them as as well as our limbs so our upper limbs and lower limbs and you know, even though there's a lot more bones in the appendicular skeleton, and you don't need to know the specific number of bones per axial and appendicular, um, but just, you know, know what um, makes up the axial and the appendicular skeleton. So, like I said, even though there's more bones in the appendicular skeleton, we have mirror images, right? So, um, our left and our right limbs should be exactly the same, as well as our left and right um, pelvic girdles and uh, pectoral girdles. So, even though it looks more daunting that there's a lot more uh, bones, it's actually a little um, less daunting because you're just doubling up on the limbs, right? So you're just going to have left and rights of everything. Whereas in the axial skeleton, we have a lot of bones in the skull. It may not look like it, but that's going to be our uh, biggest challenge of the axial skeleton. All right, so let's get right into the skull. So even though it looks like it's just one big bone around the brain, it's actually a lot of smaller bones. And we have a bunch of small bones in our face as well. So we actually split up the skull into the cranium, which is what surrounds our brain. And it also provides a lot of attachments for the neck muscles. So we have to be able to turn our head and neck. And so there's lots of attachments on the base of, this, of the cranium uh, for those muscles. And then we have all the smaller facial bones. So this is really the framework of our face, but we also have a lot of cavities, right? So we have a lot of sensory reception in our head. We have eyes for sight, right? We have a nose for smell, and we have a mouth for taste, okay? So these are all these cavities, which may or may not cause these holes in the bone because we have to connect um, up these sensory receptors up to our brain. So there's also gonna be passageways for air and food, right? So lots of holes in the head um, for nerves and 
um, passageways for food and air. Uh, we also have teeth, right? So a big part of our facial bones is holding our teeth in place as well as all of the, the muscles of our face. So we, um, as a species, but a lot of other species as well, communicate a lot through facial expressions. So we have a lot of tiny muscles in the face that are allow us to make different expressions. And so those muscles are anchored to uh, the facial bones and then they actually connect straight to um, the skin of our face. For a lot of fine motor movement. So if we look a little bit more at our cranium, we can actually divide the cranium into the cranial vault, which houses the brain and the base of the cranium. So the, the vault is actually divided into three distinct areas. They call them steps or fossa, um, and fossa are just um, like indentations. So essentially you have an anterior or more forward fossa, um, middle and posterior fossa. And these guys essentially are little cups essentially in the base um, of the cranial vault here. And essentially it holds the brain into place. So it allows for the curvature of the brain and it keeps the brain kind of situated in the cranium, okay? And then the top of our uh, cranium or skull is the skull cap. Okay, so that's just the top of our skull. And then we have a base. Okay, and that's just the inferior part of the skull. And really this is a lot um, for attachments for muscles, neck muscles, right? As well as the spinal cord comes through uh, the base of the cranium as well, okay? So here's the image from your textbook, just showing uh, those delineations of the skull. So the cranium versus the facial bones, um, our different uh, cranial vaults, right? The fossas in the cranial vault. Um, and this also shows those vaults as well, taking that skull cap off and looking down into the cranial vault. So now if we look, we said that the skull has a lot of holes in it or cavities or passageways. So let's look a little bit more at these smaller cavities of the skull. So essentially we have to have a passageway for our ear, right? Our ear canal. So we have a middle and inner ear cavity. And this is really at the lateral aspect of um, the cranial base. So it's a little bit lower um, and lateral, right? We have orbits, okay? So that allows space for the eyeball and associated structures of the eyeball. We've got a lot of eye muscles that attach to the eye to allow movement of the eyeball. Uh, there's also a lot of fat um, on the, at the back of the eye uh, to insulate and help protect the eye when it moves around the orbit. Okay. And then the nasal cavity, right? So we have a passageway for air, but it's also how we're able to sense uh, smell. Okay. So the nasal cavity, we'll talk a lot more about the nasal cavity and why there's all these uh, little bones kind of sticking into the nasal cavity. They have an important job in um, warming up our air and all of that as it comes through the nasal cavity. And then we also have air-filled sinuses in the skull. So it may not seem like it, but a lot of our um, bones in our face and even in a little bit in the cranium, uh, we have a couple bones that have these air-filled sinuses. So essentially it is around the nasal cavity, so a couple of bones around the nasal cavity, contain these air-filled uh, pockets or sinuses. And most of you guys are familiar with probably what a sinus is, right? You get a cold, a head cold, and you those sinuses fill with mucus instead of air, and so you get this increased sinus pressure. But uh, air sinuses uh, or nasal sinuses are supposed to be full of air, 
and it just allows more heating and circulation of air uh, when it comes into your um, through your nasal cavity and into your respiratory system. So we'll talk a bit more about those. Uh, they call them paranasal sinuses as well. Okay. It also helps to lighten uh, the weight of your skull. So not only do we have those uh, openings that we just talked about, passageways, we have a lot of smaller openings as well. And this may be for blood vessels or nerves or the spinal cord, but there's 85 of these named openings and we're gonna learn a few of them. But mostly when you hear these three words in the name, you're gonna know that it's a hole. It's an opening of some sort. So a foramina, a canal, and a fissure. So these are all words um, that are going to cl clue you in that it's a hole in the head. Okay, and these are holes that are for these important structures. So one of the biggest holes in the in the skull is for the spinal cord, right? So the spinal cord has to get out of the skull and into uh, the vertebral column. Okay. We also have a lot of important blood vessels that are uh, coming to and from the brain. And then we also have a lot of nerves. So we have 12 cranial nerves that are coming out to our face and to other parts of the body uh, that uh, have a lot of important jobs. And we'll talk a whole lecture on uh, cranial nerves as well. Okay, but the nerve has to have a passageway or a hole uh, to allow for it to get out in and out of the skull uh, to the brain. So let's go ahead and look at these cranial bones. So we only have eight bones in the cranium. We have two that are paired, meaning that there's one on either side of the head and four unpaired, meaning there's only one of them. So our paired bones are the temporal bones and the parietal bones. And we're gonna uh, show you on a different slide all these labeled, but here's our temporal bone right here in orange and then the parietal bone here in pink. And then our four unpaired bones are the frontal bone here in yellow, occipital bone here in brown, the sphenoid bone here in pink, and the ethmoid bone, which you can barely see in here, which is brown, okay? And we'll have better images of those to show you. So here they are all labeled, okay, from one view. So this is just a lateral view of the skull. Here is a frontal view of the skull with those bones labeled for us so we can get a better view of that sphenoid bone right here in the back of the orbit. So it looks like it's got a lot of holes in it. All right. And then that ethmoid bone sitting kind of right between the eyeballs. Okay. And it also comes down here and makes up part of that nasal cavity. So we said that the skull looks kind of like one large bone, and that's because those smaller bones are all connected uh, very close together. And where they come together, we call it a suture line. So essentially that's where one cranial bone meets another. So we create a couple of these suture lines uh, on the skull. So we actually have names for them. So the first one, and I've kind of color coded them, so hopefully they make a little more sense, is the coronal suture. So you think kind of like where a crown would sit on your head or um, a frontal plane or a coronal plane, right? Remember our um, slices, right? One of our transverse planes. So it's going to be connected between the parietal bones on either side and the frontal bone. Okay, so that's where it comes together. And then we have the squamous suture. So think S for squamous. And this is in blue here. So it kind of makes, if you imagine it kind of continues, it makes a little bit of an S shape. And that's where the parietal bone meets the temporal bone. Okay, and that's the squamous suture. And then we have the sagittal suture, 
think a sagittal plane or mid sagittal plane right down the middle of your head. And that's essentially where the two parietal bones meet in the middle. Okay. And then last but not least, we have the lambdoid suture. And if you know anything about Greek letters, essentially it looks kind of like a lambda sign, which is this little symbol right here. Okay, and that's where the occipital bone meets the two parietal bones. Okay, and I'll have another picture of that so you can see it a little bit better and how it looks like a lambda sign. So here are those sutures all labeled, and here's a posterior view so you can kind of see how that lambdoid suture comes up and comes back down kind of to an apex. So you can kind of imagine a little bit it looks like a lambda sign or like an upside down V or a pyramid. And then we have that sagittal suture, right, where the two parietal bones come together. We have the squamous suture here where the parietal and temporal bones meet and that coronal suture where the parietal and temporal and frontal bone, excuse me, meet. Okay. And those are our sutures. And then we do have these sutural bones that's kind of individual. Um, some people have them, some people don't. Okay, so it's not a fracture or anything like that. They just um, have these little sutural bones in there. Okay, common in the lambdoid suture. So now we're going to go individually through the cranial bones and look at some of the bone markings that we're interested in. So whether it's going to be um, a hole or a sinus or something like that, we're going to look at uh, some of the features of each individual cranial bone. So first we're going to start with the easiest one, and that's the frontal bone. And really it forms our forehead, okay, and the roofs of the orbit. And we do have a frontal sinus, so we do have a sinus in this frontal bone. So they're called the frontal sinuses, okay. And then we have a couple of markings. So we have this supraorbital margin, and essentially it just makes up that superior part of the orbit. Okay. Then we have this supraorbital foramen, which is a little, sometimes it's a notch and not a full passageway, but it is a passageway for a nerve and artery. It just depends on what skull you're looking at. Okay, another kind of individual thing, but there is going to be a little notch there, if not a hole. And then this part right between your eyeballs that kind of um, pouches forward a little bit, pooches forward, that's your glabella. And essentially this is where kind of your eyebrows come together. Okay, so it's really this smooth part of this frontal bone. Okay. So now we're going to look at the occipital bone, which forms that posterior part of the cranium, and it ha makes up a majority of the cranial base. So it articulates with both the temporal bones on either side and the parietal bones superiorly. And one big thing about the occipital bone is it contains the foramen magnum. Okay, the biggest hole in the skull, and that is for your spinal cord. Okay, so that's where your spinal cord comes out. And then we also have these little projections coming down, and they are called occipital condyles. Okay. And that's where you're going to attach the skull to the first vertebrae, and that's C1, cervical vertebrae 1. And it also has its own name called the atlas, and we'll talk about the vertebrae in a minute. Okay, but it's one of the few vertebrae that actually has its own name. So a few more features of the occipital bone is it has this crest in the back. Okay, it's called the external occipital crest. And then there's these lines coming off of that occipital crest. 
and there's they are called um, nuchal lines because that's where the nuchal ligament attaches and that's one of the biggest ligaments in the back of your neck okay to help keep your head um, upward and not falling forward there are also, um, there's also a significant hole called the hypoglossal foramen, but it's hard to appreciate in the pictures because essentially it sits right under these occipital condyles and it kind of goes at a horizontal um, direction into the spinal cord kind of. And essentially that's for the hypoglossal nerve. Okay. So hopefully we'll be able to um, appreciate it a little better on the visible body three-dimensional models. So now we're going to talk about the temporal bones. So we have paired temporal bones, one on either side. And these guys have kind of three parts of the temporal bone. So they have actually different names for the different regions of the bone. And the biggest region is called the squamous part and it makes up that squamous suture that we just talked about. Uh, but it also forms the zygomatic process, which um, is going to be part of your cheek. Okay, So essentially it's going to come and connect up with one of your facial bones. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. We have the tympanic part, which is the most inferior part, but it is what houses your external ear canal. So this is the hole for your ear canal. And it also has this styloid process, which is important um, in swallowing, muscles of your swallowing, um, as well as the larynx. So those muscles of the larynx um, are going to attach to this styloid process. And then the petrous part, which is kind of the uh, more posterior and inferior part, is going to house the middle and inner ear um, structures. And we'll talk all about the ear uh, when we talk about our special senses. So it's how we're able to um, communicate with our brain what we're listening to. So we have a middle and inner ear, and it's actually within uh, this temporal bone. Okay. So what are some important features of the temporal bone? We have some foramina, which are holes, right? So one of the biggest is the jugular foramen. And this is actually right at the junction between the temporal bone and the occipital bone. So you could say it's part of either bone, either occipital or temporal bone, but usually it goes um, on the temporal side because it makes up a little more in the temporal bone. And this is where your jugular vein runs, which is why it's called the jugular foramen. Uh, you also have some important nerves that run through there as well. And then we also have the carotid canal. Okay, so that's seen on this um, inferior view, and that's the hole right in front of the jugular foramen. So they sit kind of right next to each other, which makes sense because your carotid artery and your jugular uh, vein run closely together in your neck and up to your brain. Uh, while the carotid is going into your brain, the jugular is going away from your brain. And then we have this fake hole. It looks quite large and maybe important, but it's called the foramen lacerum. And so in the living skull, it's actually covered with um, a tendinous uh, structure, ligamentous structure. So it's actually not a true hole in the living skull, but uh, once all the soft tissues go away, uh, it, is, it becomes a hole. Then we also have the external and internal acoustic meatus. So we saw the hole outside um, on that uh, temporal bone. Okay, so we have, that's the external acoustic meatus, meaning there's a hole okay, for our hearing canal. Okay, and then if you look on the inside, we have an internal acoustic meatus. Okay, so that that connects the outer ear to the middle inner ear, and then the nerve from that inner ear is going to go to the brain. And that's one of our cranial nerves. 
Okay, actually two cranial nerves kind of running together. Okay, going to that inner ear structure, which is all within that temporal bone. Now we do have a couple other uh, structures in the temporal bone that are important for um, neck muscles and um, chewing. So there is a joint okay, that uh, articulates with the mandible. So the mandible is what makes up your jaw okay, and it comes up and articulates with the temporal bone and that's why we call it the temporomandibular joint okay, or TMJ. So a lot of people have trouble with their TMJ joint, but if you look at just the temporal bone, you have an indentation here on either side, and that's the mandibular fossa. Okay, so that's where that mandible is going to come up and articulate with the skull. And next to that, kind of right behind it, is what's called this mastoid process. And essentially, it's a big uh, connector of neck muscles. So we said that the base of the skull is really important for connecting up with neck muscles, right? We have to be able to turn our head, you know, nod our head, all that good stuff. And we can't do that without our neck muscles. And so we have a lot of big attachments of muscles onto the base of the skull. And that's one of the biggest is the mastoid process. Okay, and we'll learn all about that muscle that attaches there. So those were kind of the easier cranial bones, the bigger ones that we can see the majority of them on the outside of the skull. And now we have two that are more inside the middle of the skull. Okay. And the first one is the sphenoid bone. And it actually spans the width of that cranial floor. And it's pink here in the picture. Okay, so the temporal bone is here. Okay. The occipital bone is here, frontal bone is here, and then right in the middle is going to be that sphenoid bone. And that PH makes that F sound, so sphenoid. I know it's kind of a strange word. right? And it's interesting, so if you remove the sphenoid bone from the skull, that's this image right here. So you're actually taking that cranial bone out of the skull, and it actually looks kind of like it has wings. Right? And they do name them wings, which is interesting. So it looks kind of like a bat. So we have a body, which is kind of the central portion. And then we have a few processes that they call wings. Okay, And then we have a lot of openings. See, there's a lot of holes here through that sphenoid bone. And there's a few that are super important Okay, that we'll go through. So what are some important landmarks of the sphenoid bone? So here we've removed it from the skull, so it's just all on its own, and so we can kind of better appreciate um, it uh, outside of the skull. Okay. So what are some important landmarks? Well, we have the body. So the body uh, makes up the middle portion of the sphenoid bone. And if we look at it from kind of top down, okay, we're going to look at this little section here that looks kind of like a seat. It's an indentation and it's called the cella tersica. And that means Turkish saddle. So it actually looks like uh, a saddle that you would sit in on a horse. That's what it's named after. And then within this body, we actually have some sinuses. So these are, these are the sphenoidal sinuses even weirder word, right? And then we have some wings. So we have some greater and lesser wings. So the big ones here are the greater wings. And then we have this littler wing here that kind of projects um, more posteriorly or superiorly, and that's the lesser wing. Don't worry as much about the wings, okay? And then we have these projections that come down or more inferiorly, and they are called the pterygoid processes. Okay. So we said there's a lot of holes. So what are these holes? Okay. 
So I have another picture of the holes, uh, but you can kind of get an idea here. Okay, and they're gonna be highlighted in different images. But we have what's called the optic canal. So if you kind of place this image here back into the skull, you notice the two holes up here are facing right into the back of those orbits. Okay. So optic, right? Whenever you hear the word optic, you think sight. So the optic canal carries the optic nerve, which is your nerve to the back of your eye, which allows you to see. And then we also have the superior orbital fissure. So it's also part of the back of the orbit. Okay, so here I know it's really hard to appreciate in this image and I understand that, but hopefully in another image you'll be able to see it a little better. But the, we call it a fissure because it's not a perfectly round hole. And that is where a lot of the attachments of the eyeball are gonna run through the orbital fissure, okay? And then we have three holes kind of in a row. If you notice that, and kind of you can see it better on the blown up picture, but there's kind of one, two, three, right in a row on either side. And so if you go from top to bottom, okay, we have the foramen ovale, sorry, foramen rotundum first, which is kind of the most uh, round. It's a very round hole. Think rotund, right, round. And then kind of the more oval one is the foramen ovale. And then the smallest one at the end is the foramen spinosum. And I don't worry as much about the foramen spinosum. Okay. So if we look kind of at a mid sagittal section of the skull, we can better appreciate some of those sphenoid structures. So here's the sphenoid bones sitting right in the middle of the skull. And we can kind of see these wings. So the greater wing, lesser wing. And then we see this little indentation here. And I said there was like a little saddle or a seat and that's that cella tersica, okay, sitting right here. And then in that body, we actually see these air filled sinuses. So those are the sphenoidal sinuses sitting right here. Okay, so hopefully that's a little easier to appreciate in this picture than in the last picture. And then we also blew up that other picture so we could appreciate those um, holes a little bit better as well. So we have the optic canal here, and that's going to run right to the back of the eye for the optic nerve. We have our three holes lined up, foramen rotundum, foramen ovale, and foramen foramen spinosum. Okay. And then that's that fake out hole right there, foramen lucerum. And then we had those two other holes we talked about with the temporal bone, the internal acoustic meatus and our jugular foramen. And then if you notice, there's actually little holes right here. That's that hypoglossal canal that we talked about a while ago with the occipital bone. So it's kind of on the inside of that foramen magnum. And last but not least on the cranial bones is the ethmoid bone. And this one's really hard to appreciate from the outside of the skull. So again, we have that mid sagittal view here and it sits right in front of the sphenoid bone. So it's this brown bone right here, kind of right between your eyeballs. Okay, and if we take it out of the skull, that's what it looks like here. Kind of an interesting little shaped bone. So it forms the middle region really between your nasal cavity and your orbits, okay, your eyeballs. So even though the ethmoid bone is quite small, it has some important structures. So the first one we'll talk about is the cribiform plate and the cristigalli. So these two structures you are able to see if you look inside that cranial vault, okay? So we don't have to remove it from the skull to be able to see these structures. So if we look right, it's wedged right in between that frontal bone. And you notice that there's these little holes, okay? And these little tiny holes are for the olfactory bulb. 
and the olfactory bulb is connected to your olfactory nerve. Now, does anyone know what olfactory means? So olfactory has to do with smell. Okay, so olfactory bulb sends these little nerves down through these holes and into the top of your nasal cavity. And that's how you're actually able to pick up um, the chemicals and the air as smell. Okay. And then in between those cribriform plates, so we call those little holes and that whole area the cribriform plate, in between the two there's this line and it kind of sticks up so we can appreciate this better when we actually pull that bone out of the skull. And now we can look and see that it's actually this little protrusion that comes up, okay? And we call that the Christigalli. And it's in between the cribriform plates. So here are the two plates on either side and that Christigalli is sticking up right in the middle. And it's formed because the Christigalli is called uh, the rooster's comb. Okay, so it looks kind of like, you know, if you've ever seen a rooster, it has that little um, thing on the top of its head, right? A rooster's comb, and that's what it's named after. And this is an attachment for um, a ligamentous structure in your brain called the falx cerebri. So you don't really need to know that, but just as, as a, you know, FYI for your information, okay? So it does, it does attach to something important, and that's um, the middle section between your two hemispheres of your brain. Now we do have some other things that are important with the ethmoid bone. So it does contain its own sinuses, okay? So when we look at the bone itself here, it has these two kind of structures to the side. Okay, these ethmoidal labyrinth, and you don't need to know uh, that name, but inside those labyrinths, there is um, these things called air cells, and they're essentially the ethmoid sinuses. Okay, a little different than some of the other sinuses we'll look at, but we do have an ethmoid sinus. Okay. And then the other big part that you can see when it's inside the skull, um, are these nasal concha and the perpendicular plate. So if you look into the nasal cavity from the front of the skull, you can actually see these uh, protrusions coming down from the top of the nasal cavity and from the sides. And if we looked back at our other picture, you can appreciate it as well. But essentially there's these protrusions here on either side and in the middle. And that perpendicular plate actually makes up that superior part of your nasal septum. So the nasal septum is part of the bony structure between the two parts of your nasal cavity. Okay, And so that's part of the ethmoid bone. And then these nasal, nasal concha are going to be a little better appreciated when we look at a different image, but essentially they come down and kind of curve around, um, kind of like conch shells, which is why they're named nasal concha. I don't know if you've ever seen a conch shell, you know, the ones they blow at on the um, beach that make the noise, those are conch shells. And so they have these kind of scroll-like spirals and essentially it's part of the nasal cavity and it increases surface area of your nasal cavity. And we have a, another image um, that'll show that a little bit better. So before we go into our facial bones, let's just look at that ethmoid bone again. So here's that perpendicular plate coming down, and there's those nasal concha on either side, okay, coming down from the um, ethmoid bone that's stuck right there, kind of in between your eyeballs, okay? So now that we've finished the cranial bones, we're gonna now look at our facial bones. Okay, so we have two that are unpaired, meaning there's only one of them, and six that are paired. Okay, so we have two of them. So our unpaired facial bones are our mandible, that's making up the jaw, and the vomer bone. Okay, and this little blue one right here that is connecting up to that ethmoid bone, finishing off that nasal septum, is going to be the vomer bone. 
And now our six paired bones are the maxilla. So maxilla, on either, one maxilla on either side. So it splits right here. Okay. The zygomatic bones, which really make up the bulk of your cheek, right under your eye, right? In blue here, or kind of greenish blue. Your nasal bones, which make up the bony part of your nose. Okay. The lacrimal bones, which are bright green here, very tiny bones on the insides of your orbit. Okay. The palatine bone, which is hard to see, we can't see it on this image, so I'll show you on another image, but it makes up part of your hard palate on the roof of your mouth. And the inferior nasal concha. So we said we had some nasal concha coming down off that ethmoid bone, but now we actually have a facial bone that makes up another nasal concha, and that's the inferior nasal concha. Okay. So let's go through these facial bones individually, and we're going to start with the mandible, because there's a lot of important things on the mandible. So it's your jawbone, and it's the largest and strongest facial bone. And it's the only one that moves in the skull. So if you think of your entire skull, the only bone that's able to move is your mandible, okay, for chewing. And it's composed of two different parts, okay. Obviously, we have this horizontal part, and then these two upward parts, upright parts, and they call these L, it kind of looks like an L, right? So the elbow of the L is called the ramus. So two rami, plural, okay, and that horizontal body, okay. And there are some landmarks that we want to notify on the mandible, and we have a couple of foramen and we have a couple of processes, okay, or projections. So the foramen, we have the holes here, one here on either side, and one here on the inside of the back of your jaw. And so the big one back here is the mandibular foramen. Now, has anyone gone to the dentist? I'm assuming many of you have, and they stick that giant needle into the back of your jaw and it hurts like heck. Well, they're aiming for this mandibular foramen because guess what runs through there? Your nerve. So a nerve that comes down to your teeth runs through that mandibular foramen. Okay, so it's on that medial aspect of the mandible, of the ramus of the mandible, okay, so inside. And then we also have the mental foramen for another nerve, okay. Now we have some processes, so we have the condylar process on either side, and the condylar process is important because it connects up with that mandibular fossa on the temporal bone. So that makes up that temporomandibular joint. Okay, so that's how you're able to move your mandible and your jaw. And then the other one, the other projection here that doesn't really connect to anything but is more for muscle attachment is going to be the coronoid process. So condylar process, coronoid process. I know that can be confusing, right? They sound very similar, but anything with condyle or condylar is going to be a rounded structure and usually part of a joint. Okay, so you'll see condyle, condylar again on some other bones, okay? And then the ramus is that elbow section, okay? of the mandible. And then we have these alveolar processes, which are essentially the holes for where your teeth go. Okay, so those are the holes in the mandible for your teeth. So now our other bones that hold teeth are the maxillary bones. Okay, so these guys are going to be opposite to the mandible. Okay, they're going to carry your upper teeth and they articulate, meaning they have joints with all the other facial bones except the mandible. So they actually don't articulate. It doesn't articulate with the mandible, okay? Just the teeth touch together, okay? 
And we have one on either side, right? So one maxilla here and another one here. And within the maxilla, we do have sinuses. And these are some of the big sinuses that are affected when you get a cold, right? Are your maxillary sinuses. So, you know, you have pressure right on either side of your nose under your eyes, right? And that's the maxillary bones, maxillary sinuses. And it forms a little part of your orbit, okay? And a little part of your nasal cavity, okay? And what are some landmarks that we're uh, worried about, okay? So if we come down here, this is just one maxilla, okay? And so we have two maxillas, right? So we have a foramen, and that's the infraorbital foramen, or right here as well, okay? Now, infra means below, so below the orbit, okay? So here's our orbit. Just like we had a supraorbital foramen, supra meaning above, now we have an infraorbital foramen below the orbit, okay? Now the palatine process of the maxilla is on the inferior side, so it makes up the majority of your hard palate in your oral cavity. So we'll, we'll flip it over and take a look at that in a minute, okay? We already talked about those maxillary sinuses. And then we have this zygomatic process. Okay, so the zygomatic process comes out right here and connects up with that zygomatic bone. Okay. And then the alveolar processes are just like in the mandible, it's just where your teeth go. Okay. So now let's look at the rest of the facial bones. There aren't as many landmarks that we're worried about for these guys. So we kind of talk, we can talk about them all together. So we have nasal bones. So they form that bridge of your nose, the bony part of your nose. So those are one on either side, fairly small, right? Are the nasal bones. And then we have the zygomatic bones which are kind of green right here, and they form that lateral wall of the orbit, majority of your cheek, right? As well as they form that zygomatic arch. So it comes back and connects up with the zygomatic process of the temporal bone and creates that zygomatic arch on the side of the skull. And we'll have another view that we can point that out. And then we have a paired lacrimal bones, these green ones. Okay, and it makes up part of the orbit as well. And there is a hole or a foramen called the lacrimal foramen, which allows the lacrimal duct to run through. Okay, so that's how your eyes drain the fluid off your eyes and into your nasal cavity. So that's why when you, when your eyes run, right, when you cry, your nose runs also because you're draining all that fluid, all those tears into your nasal cavity. And it goes through the lacrimal duct, which runs through the lacrimal foramen of that lacrimal bone, okay? And then vomer, we've already talked a little bit about it, but it makes up that inferior portion of the nasal septum, okay? Kind of the base of the nasal cavity. So here's a better picture underneath. So if we look at the inferior view or the base of the skull, we get a better picture of some of those palatine structures. So we have the palatine process of the maxilla, which makes up the majority of your hard palate. And then we have the palatine bones that make up the rest of the hard palate. And then just below there, we have the vomer. Okay, so that's the inferior part of the vomer bone, and then it protrudes upward to create that nasal septum. Okay, and we also have those inferior nasal concha that are coming down, they're kind of a lighter green. Okay. So of course the palatine bones and the palatine process are both part of that hard palate. Okay, and those inferior nasal concha are part of that nasal cavity with the ethmoid bone.
So now we're going to talk about some special parts of the skull, some of these passageways that we've talked about, and what bones actually make up those uh, passageways. So first we're going to talk, talk about the nasal cavity. So the nasal cavity is, um, we're talking about the bony part of the nasal cavity, but again, we can't forget that a, lo a large part of your nose is made up of cartilage, right? So wherever the bone stops, you're gonna continue with the nasal cartilages that make up the majority of our nose, but we're talking about the bony part. So when we talk about which bones make up the nasal cavity, we have to remember that the bottom of the nasal cavity is also the roof of our mouth. So the same bones are going to split the nasal cavity and the oral cavity, okay? So the roof of the nasal cavity is made up of the ethmoid bones, cribriform plates, okay? So remember those cribriform plates has the um, olfactory nerve running through it to allow for smell. So that's the roof, okay? So here's our ethmoid bone in brown. So that's gonna make up the roof of the nasal cavity up here. And then the floor, and remember we said the floor of the nasal cavity is the same as the roof of our mouth, the oral cavity, and that's gonna be the palatine process of the maxilla and the palatine bone themselves, so that hard palate, right? Okay. And then the lateral walls. So each wall of the nasal cavity is gonna be formed by a couple of different bones. So we have that ethmoid nasal concha Okay, we have the nasal bones really superiorly. We have part of the maxilla and we have that inferior nasal concha as well. Okay, and so all these together are going to form as well as part of that palatine bone back here. So maxilla and palatine bone make up part of the lateral wall and the floor. Okay. So again, just spend a little time with your colors and uh, names, and I want you guys to know the bones that make up the nasal cavity and the orbit, okay? We'll talk about the orbit in a minute. So now around the nasal cavity, we said we had these air-filled sinuses within some of these uh, cranial and facial bones. So we call them all together the paranasal sinuses. So which bones have sinuses? And I want you to know this, okay? So the frontal bone is the only cranial bone that has a sinus, but the ethmoid, sphenoid, and maxillary bones all have sinuses, okay? Air-filled sinuses. So they're lined with mucous membranes and essentially it increases um, the air filtration process of when you breathe in air into your respiratory tract. So it warms, moistens, and filters the air as it comes in before it hits the lungs. But again, I said it kind of lightens the skull as well, so it makes it not quite so heavy, okay? So just like we talked about the bones of the nasal cavity, I want you guys to know the bones of the orbit, okay? So if we look at the orbit itself, we see lots of colors, right? So there are a lot of bones that make up the orbit, and that's seven to be exact, and I want you guys to be able to know and recognize these bones. So the frontal bone okay, is yellow, the sphenoid bone in pink, and here you can really see that orbital fissure. So there's the orbital fissure, and there's the optic canal. So those are those holes in the sphenoid bone that we talked about for important structures to the back of the eye, okay? Ethmoid, which is this kind of brownish tan one right here, okay? Lacrimal in green here, maxilla in purple, okay? zygomatic in blue and then below here is also the palatine so we can't really appreciate the palatine in this picture okay but we could in the last picture if you looked at it but again it's the palatine bone okay and then last but not least i want you guys just to know about the hyoid bone 
So it's below the mandible or inferior to the mandible, and it's the only bone in the body with no direct articulation with any other bone. So it doesn't create any joints, but what it does do is it anchors the tongue, okay? So it's kind of this movable base where all the muscles of the tongue are going to attach to, okay? So I know we spent a long time going through the skull. This is a long lecture and usually I split it up into two lectures. So feel free to uh, take your time and listen to it over multiple days. But now we're going to talk about the next section of the axial skeleton and that's the vertebral column. And we have five major regions of the vertebral column. And how I like to remember the number of vertebrae per region is the times a day that you eat meals. Or, you know, approximately, because maybe not everybody eats their breakfast at seven, but we have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and five lumbar vertebrae. So these are our individual vertebrae, okay, that make up the vertebral column and then we have two sections down at the very bottom that are actually some fused vertebrae together so the sacrum is actually five fused vertebrae okay so it looks kind of like a little wing okay and it's curved okay and then at the bottom of the sacrum is the coccyx and that is four fused vertebrae and that's your tailbone is the coccyx okay so again, don't worry too much about the numbers of vertebrae, just know the different regions and what they're named. So the vertebral column is really important in that, especially as a biped species, right, we walk on two legs, is the curvature of the vertebral column. So how these vertebrae actually create um, a natural curvature of the spine. And so we have some normal curvatures that allow us to better compensate um, for walking upright. Okay, it increases the resilience of our spine. Okay, so we have uh, two curves that are concave. And if you look at it from the posterior view, that's how we refer to it as concave. So if you look at the posterior view of the spine, right? So if we look at our spine here, this is an anterior view. And if we look at it this way, look at the spine on, okay? That would be a posterior view. So the cervical vertebrae, which is in the neck here, concaves so it means it curves away from us like into a cave so cervical and lumbar curve away from us okay concave and then our thoracic and sacral parts of the vertebral column convex curve convexly so they come toward us okay and the sacrum so if you notice every section is opposite right? So it creates this kind of S shape, okay? And this is important, and our spine should be shaped this way, okay? Because it, like I said, it increases the resilience of the spine, okay? And especially being a biped species. If you look at uh, four-legged species, they don't have um, these such drastic curvatures of the spine, so what are the functions of the vertebral column? Okay, we're like, okay, well, we know about curvatures now. It connects up to our skull, right? And it provides attachments for our limbs. Um, what runs through the vertebral column? Our spinal cord, yeah. So what are some of these functions, right? So what happens is it transmits weight of our trunk to our lower limb, being a biped species, right? So we have all this weight of our torso, our trunk, and we have to transmit that to our lower limbs, and that goes through the spine, okay, through the vertebral column. It also surrounds and protects that spinal cord, right? So that's really important. 
So our spinal cord has all of our nerves that are gonna run to our limbs and our body, right? So that's important to protect. But a big thing is, is it has attachments for all the muscles of the neck and back. Okay, so we said that we have some attachments to the base of the skull for our neck muscles. And now we have a bunch of postural back muscles, right? To keep ourselves in the correct posture. And all these vertebrae are attached together via ligaments. So again, as a reminder, ligaments are bone to bone connection between neck of the connective tissue. And what type of connective tissue? Dense, regular, right? Dense, regular connective tissue. So we have these ligaments and they have these longitudinal ligaments, meaning running up and down longitudinally on the anterior side of the spine as well as on the posterior side. Okay. So let's take a closer look at those ligaments of the spine. So these are the supporting ligaments for the vertebral column. So we have the anterior longitudinal ligament which attaches all the bodies of the vertebrae and those intervertebral discs. And essentially what it does, it, it is trying to prevent hyperextension. And hyperextension in your spine would be bending backwards. So it's trying to keep you from bending too far backwards. Okay. And then you have a posterior longitudinal ligament. Okay, so it's pointing to, so here, here. Okay, so it runs between the spines of um, the vertebrae. And then there's kind of a view right there. And these guys attached to the intervertebral disc on the posterior sides and they really help to uh, prevent hyperflexion. So we said the anterior side prevents hyperextension, which is bending your back backwards, your spine backwards. And then opposite, we're trying to prevent hyperflexion from the posterior longitudinal ligament. Now, if you notice, the anterior side is quite wide Okay, so lots of strength in the anterior side, whereas the posterior longitudinal ligament is quite narrow and it's relatively weak. And it's kind of broken up by a lot of these um, spinous processes of the vertebrae. So it doesn't do as good a job. We're also able to flex a lot better than we can extend, okay? So now let's talk about the intervertebral discs. Okay, so we have the vertebrae, the individual bony vertebrae, and we have some longitudinal ligaments on the anterior and posterior sides, kind of holding everything together, preventing hyperextension, hyperflexion. And now we have these kind of compression discs in between the bodies of the vertebrae. Okay, so they act like kind of cushions between the vertebrae. And they're composed of two different parts of the intervertebral disc. And the center part is called the nucleus pulposus. So if we look at an image here, and we're looking down on a vertebrae, so here's the body of the vertebrae. Here's some processes that we'll talk about. And then here's the spinal cord running through the middle. And here is our intervertebral disc. Okay. Now the middle part here is this kind of gelatinous um, part, uh, inner part of the disc, and it's really important for compressive stress. So we have a lot of compressive forces, especially because we're transmitting all the weight of our torso into our lower limbs. So we have a lot of compressive forces onto our spine. And so this nucleus pulposus is trying to counteract and absorb a lot of that compressive force. And then we have this ring. If you notice, there's kind of a ring around the disc. Okay, 
and that's the annulus fibrosus. And this is our fibrocartilage part. So remember we had that special type of uh, cartilage, fibrocartilage, and we said we found it in our intervertebral discs. So it's not quite hyaline cartilage, it's similar, but a little more fibrous than hyaline cartilage. And essentially it contains that nucleus pulposus. So it's ligamentous and it's supposed to kind of prevent the nucleus pulposus from spewing out, okay? Because we're all this compressive force, so it's trying to hold it all together. But what happens is, is sometimes that doesn't always work, right? And this is what happens in a herniated disc. So essentially what happens is that annulus fibrosis is going to pooch out into the spinal cord area, okay? And it normally happens on the posterior aspect because we said that that posterior ligament is a lot weaker than the anterior ligament. So if it's gonna fail, it's gonna fail posteriorly. And why it can be so painful, right, is if that disc is protruding out into the, where the spinal cord is, it can push on all these spinal nerves. Okay, that are trying to come out from the spinal cord. So you can get a lot of problems with herniated discs, okay? Just as an example. But I want you guys to focus more on, you know, what the disc is made out of and what its function is, okay? So now let's go through the general structure of a vertebrae. So we said we had three different types of vertebrae in different regions, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, but all of them share these common structures. And in our picture here, we're going to use a thoracic vertebrae as our classic vertebrae. And we have the majority of our vertebrae are thoracic, so it's safe to uh, say that it is the most general vertebrae, okay? So we have a body, okay? So we have a body of the vertebrae, and that's where that intervertebral disc sits, right? On either side of the body in between the two vertebrae. And then we have a vertebral arch, which is right here. And the vertebral arch is made up of a couple structures, okay? So these little archways here are called a lamina. So there's a lamina on either side. And then on the lateral side is going to be a pedicle. So we have two pedicles on either side. So we have two pedicles and two lamina making up our overarching vertebral arch. And then in between the vertebral arch and the body is our vertebral foramen, right? We said a foramen is a hole. That's a pretty large hole. What runs through that hole? That's our spine. Right, so our spinal cord runs through the vertebral foramen. Now we have a few of these processes sticking out, right, for muscle attachment and ligament attachment. And the biggest one that's most posterior is the spinous process. So we have one spinous process and we have two transverse processes sticking out to either side. Now I like to think transverse, like a T, like you're crossing the T, so they're the horizontal processes. Now, all these vertebrae are stacked on top of each other, right? They have the intervertebral discs sitting in between the bodies, but they're going to be creating joints, right? Because your vertebrae is allowed to move and so there is going to be some joint connection between each of these vertebrae. And what's creating those joints are these articular processes, okay? So we have a superior and an inferior process because one vertebrae is going to articulate superiorly with the next vertebrae and inferiorly with the one below. So it's gonna be articulating most vertebrae are going to be articulating with two other vertebrates, right? Superiorly and inferiorly. So 
the facet and the articular process is just creating those um, joints. So this would be the superior articular process and facet because there's going to be a vertebrae sitting right on top of it. And then underneath, so we can't appreciate the inferior one, okay, with this picture, but I'll show you guys um, what we're talking about in another image. As well as the intervertebral foramina. So when you look at it from the lateral aspect, you can actually see spaces in between each vertebrae. And that's where your spinal nerves come out. So now that we know a few common features of each of the vertebrae, let's look at those different regions individually and what makes them different from each other. So we have seven cervical vertebrae, and these are the smallest and lightest vertebrae. So they're going to make up the neck portion of our vertebral column. Now C3 through C7 are typical cervical vertebrae. Uh, C1 and C2 are slightly different and we'll talk about them individually on the next slide. But why, how are they a little bit different than kind of our standard vertebrae? Well, the body is a little bit wider than it is tall. Okay, so it looks like it's kind of been squished. The spinous processes are short quite short, and they're forked. Another term for that is bifid, okay? So if you look at each of these spinous processes, all but seven is, um, C7 is also slightly different. It's starting to kind of look more like a thoracic vertebrae, but all these other ones uh, you can kind of imagine are these forked spinous processes. Now the vertebral foramen, so where the spinal cord passes through, is quite large and triangular. So it looks, instead of more circular, it looks kind of more like a triangle. And the transverse processes here have a hole in it. So you notice there's some extra holes that we didn't see in our classic vertebrae. And those are called transverse foramina or foramina, however you want to say it, okay? So these are our transverse processes on the sides here, okay? And in those transverse processes, we have the transverse foramen, okay? And what runs through this transverse foramen are uh, vessels, blood vessels and nerves. So it's a way to protect our blood vessels and nerves in our neck, okay? Now, I said, uh, let's take a look at those articular facets in a little, in a better view, and the cervical vertebrae are a little hard to tell, but I think it gives us the idea of what we were talking about. So each vertebrae, right, is going to articulate with a superior vertebrae and an inferior vertebrae. So if we pick out just one vertebrae, right, you're gonna have a superior and inferior one. Now they're gonna articulate with that superior and inferior vertebrae. So how do they do that? Well, those are the vertebral joints and they're the articular facets. So one is gonna face superiorly and one is gonna face inferiorly, okay? So what do they look like? So if we stack them all on top of each other, you're going to create a joint, right? So here are our joints, here are our facets, okay? So I've circled them in red to show that's the articular facet. If we look at the individual cervical vertebrae from a lateral view, we can better appreciate the superior and inferior. So here is that facet, and here is the articular process on the superior side and the inferior side. So we're gonna have the body it's not articulating with the other vertebrae because it has an intervertebral disc in between. But these guys, the facets are actually touching the other vertebrae and that's creating a joint. And this is where we have arthritis in our vertebrae is within these joints, okay? So again, you could only see that superior 
articular facet in the superior view, but you can see both of them in the lateral view. So we said that C1 and C2 are different and they have their own name, so they are special. So C1 is also known as the atlas. So if anyone has a little Greek mythology background, uh, we know that Atlas is the Greek god that holds the whole earth on his shoulders. So essentially we think of the Atlas um, because it's the one that articulates with the skull. So the skull being like the world, right? You can kind of see where they got the name. But the atlas is really funny because it actually lacks a body and a spinous process. So it's just kind of like a circle, okay? Um, so the superior articular facets are actually articulating with those occipital condyles of the skull. And the thing about the atlas is it allows for flexion and extension of the neck. So that's how you can nod your head as if you're saying yes, okay? So that's that joint between the atlas and the skull. Now the axis is different, so it articulates with C1. It does have a body and a spinous process, but it has this little projection called the dens. And the dens essentially is this little um, projection up here that articulates with C1. And essentially it, it allows a pivot point, okay? So it acts as a pivot for rotation of your atlas and the skull on your neck. So this is what allows you to rotate your head side to side in the action of as if C were saying no, okay? So let's take a look at these two guys in more detail. So here on the top we have C1 or the atlas and then at the bottom here we have C2 or the axis. Okay. So they do look quite different. So this one has no body, right? So the atlas has no body and no spinous process. So that's kind of strange. C2, or axis, has kind of this wide spinous process here, but it also has this dens, which projects outward. And it's going to articulate with C1, kind of where the body should have been in C1. So if you think about the dens as the body of C1, you kind of can see where it came from. And so this allows for that pivoting action for the head to rotate on an axis. Oh, look, it's called the axis, right? And then the other cool thing about the transverse process of C2 is it does not have the transverse foramen, just like, so C1 does have that, but C2 does not. So they're both quite different than all the rest of the cervical vertebrae, okay? So now let's talk about the thoracic vertebrae. So these guys are all going to articulate with the ribs. So they make up the thoracic rib cage. So what are some special features? Even though it's our classic rib, we do have some special features. So the body looks like a heart, right? Kind of heart shaped. The spinous processes kind of point inferiorly, so downward, okay, instead of more posteriorly. And then those transverse processes that point outward here are going to actually articulate with the ribs, okay? So between the body and the transverse processes, we actually attach in two places to the ribs, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, we do have some articulation with the ribs, so that is special. And then the articular facets, so the joints between each of the ribs here, are actually paint pointing, excuse me, posteriorly and kind of anteriorly or inferiorly. So whereas those cervical vertebrae, they were kind of stacked on top of each other up and down, these guys are kind of front to back, okay? And that allows for different movements in the vertebrae, okay? 
So let's go ahead and talk about how these thoracic vertebrae attach to the ribs. So if we take a look, and I've tried to color code these areas for us. So we said that the transverse process attaches to the rib and the body attaches to the rib, but how does that work? So when we talk about the body, okay, so the body of the vertebrae is going to attach to the head of the rib. Okay, so each rib, so here's our rib right here, okay, each rib is going to span two vertebrae. I know that sounds weird, but it's going to span two vertebrae. And the head of the head of the rib is going to attach to that um, the span of the body of the vertebrae. Okay. So each body has a superior costal facet. Costal has to do with rib, okay? And an inferior costal facet, okay, that attaches to the rib. So this would be one head of the rib here, and then there's another head of the rib, okay? So each has this kind of demi-facet, they call it, half, because it only has half the head of the rib, okay? And the only one that has the whole rib is going to be T1. So the first thoracic vertebrae has one whole rib attachment at the head, whereas the rest of them, one head of the rib spans two vertebrae. Okay, so that's the head of the rib or kind of the beginning of the rib. And then the rib makes a curve, a turn. Okay, and that turn is called the angle of the rib. And there's this tubercle. So tubercle is just a little projection on the rib, but don't worry too much about that. Um, and it's going to articulate with the transverse process. So the transverse process comes out and it's going to articulate with that more superior vertebrae. Okay. So the, if you talk about one thoracic vertebrae, okay, it has one transverse costal facet for the curve of the rib or the tubercle of the rib. And then it's going to have two costal facets, a superior and inferior costal facet for the head of the rib. Okay, so that's how it attaches right here. And you've got some ligaments to hold it in place. Okay, and then these are the articular uh, processes, articular facets for each of the ribs to attach to each other. Okay. So now our last region of individual vertebrae are the lumbar vertebrae. Now these guys are really taking the brunt force of all of our uh, torso weight. Okay, so these guys are going to try to accommodate for that. So their bodies are very thick and robust. Okay, so very large chunky bodies. Okay. Um, and again, we have those intervertebral discs in between the bodies, okay? The spinous processes are quite short and blunted, okay? And they point kind of straight out posteriorly, unlike those thoracic that kind of angle inferiorly, okay? The transverse processes are quite thin and tapered, so they're not very long, okay? They don't have to attach to any ribs. Okay, they're kind of flat, okay? And then the articular facets are directed medially and laterally, okay? So that's kind of interesting. So we just said that the thoracic vertebrae kind of point posteriorly and anteriorly, or front and back. These guys are kind of going left and right, okay? So this allows for more flexion. Okay, so if you imagine how it would allow for the movement of the spine, you can see that it would allow for more uh, flexion and extension. Okay, whereas the thoracic doesn't allow for that much um, movement really at all, and the cervical vertebrae allow for more rotational movement. Okay. So this table is just from your book to compare the three different uh, vertebrae. 
So you can really compare the similarities and differences that we just talked about uh, between the cervical vertebrae in the first column here, uh, thoracic and lumbar. Okay, and this is the superior view, okay, looking from top to bottom, and this is the lateral view from the side. Okay, so you can really compare the different bodies, the intervertebral canals, the foramen, uh, spinous processes, all that good stuff. Okay. So now let's talk about the sacrum. So the sacrum is not individual vertebrae, but five fused vertebrae together. So it makes up the posterior wall of the pelvis. So containing that pelvic cavity with all of our um, pelvic organs. Uh, it articulates superiorly up here with the lumbar vertebrae 5. And then inferiorly it articulates with the coccyx or the tailbone. So what are some special features of the sacrum? So we have this sacral promontory kind of on the anterior side facing into that pelvic cavity. So it's just kind of this bulge into that pelvic cavity, okay? And then the ala are these kind of wings on the sides and essentially uh, they develop from fused rib elements. But to me, they kind of look like little wings and they're gonna be important because um, they contain the auricular surface. So if you look at the uh, posterior view over here instead of the anterior view, here's the ala or the wing, and then on that is that auricular surface. Okay, so here's the ala, and then there's the auricular surface. And that is going to articulate with the pelvic bone or the hip bone to form the pelvis. And a lot of uh, people, you know, you hear the SI joint or the sacroiliac joint. And that is this joint right here. So this is making up that SI joint. Okay, a lot of pain um, can come from the SI joint, right? Because this is really where we are um, transferring the weight of the entire torso into that uh, pelvis and into that lower limb. So it goes through that SI joint and we have a lot of pain associated with it, um, a lot of disorders, okay? And then we have this sacral foramen or sacral foramina, which essentially are just these holes, okay? So we have anterior and posterior sacral foramina. Um, and essentially that's just where a lot of nerves are gonna run through, okay? And last but not least, the coccyx, which is the tailbone. And it's just formed by about three or four, maybe five fused vertebrae, okay? Just like the fused vertebrae of the sacrum. And it only offers very slight uh, support in the pelvic cavity to the pelvic organs. Um, it will come into play uh, when we talk about the pelvic cavity um, with the pelvis and um, the birth canal. Okay, so essentially it inhibits uh, the head of the baby coming through the birth canal. So it limits um, a lot of that movement there. So the last part of the axial skeleton is the thoracic rib cage. And so it is the bony framework of the thoracic cavity, right, or the chest. And so we have three components. That is the thoracic vertebrae in the posterior side, okay, the ribs, which are gonna make up the lateral portion of the cage, and the sternum with those costal cartilages on the anterior side. Now the whole point of the thoracic cage is really to protect those thoracic organs, right? There's some very important structures in there, including the heart and the lungs, but it also helps to support um, the pectoral girdle and the shoulders with the upper limbs. So there's a lot of muscle attachment for a lot of back muscles, but we do have some um, uh, front anterior muscles as well, okay? So the first part of the thoracic cage we're gonna talk about is the sternum. 
So it's actually three fused sections. I think it kind of looks like a necktie. It's kind of like our bony necktie. Okay, and the first superior portion is the manubrium. And the manubrium has this uh, clavicular notch right here for the clavicle, which is uh, your collarbone. Okay, uh, and it also has the jugular notch up here too. And you can actually feel the jugular notch on yourself if you just kind of run your finger up the sternum and when it dives into your neck, that's that jugular notch. And then we have the body, which is the bulk of the sternum. Okay. And we have the xiphoid process, which is way down at the bottom. And um, it starts out as cartilage, but then it does change into bone um, when, as we age. So we talked about the jugular notch on the manubrium already, but another um, landmark is going to be the sternal angle. So it's where the manubrium joins the body and it uh, creates kind of an angle. You can feel that too. It's where your sternum kind of protrudes out in the middle of your chest. Some pupils are more um, distinct than others. Just depends on how much um, muscle and fat and skin tissue you have around that area. And now let's talk about the ribs. So we said that these ribs are going to attach to the thoracic vertebrae on the posterior side. Right, so each rib is going to span two thoracic vertebrae and then it's going to attach to the sternum anteriorly via the costal cartilages. Okay, so your rib bone does not directly attach to the sternum. Okay, so we have these costal cartilages which are going to allow for some compression and movement within the thoracic cage. Okay. Now we split all of our ribs into two different categories. We call them true ribs and we call them false ribs. So what's the difference between true, true versus false ribs? So there's seven true ribs. So you can either count them, but if you notice, they're going to have their own individual costal cartilage that attaches to the sternum. Okay, so if we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, here's our last one, and it creates a whole costal cartilage. Now, if you go beyond that, they're all going to fuse together onto that seventh costal cartilage, or they're not even going to have a costal cartilage way down here, your 11th and 12th rib, okay? So these guys are all your false ribs. So there's five inferior false ribs, and they're going to either share a costal cartilage or not attach at all. And the ones that don't attach at all are called floating ribs. Okay, so there are, they are considered false ribs, and they have no anterior attachment, no costal cartilage. Okay. All right, so let's finish up the axial skeleton with some disorders and some development. So what are some disorders? Well, if we talk about um, the skull, we have something called a cleft palate, which is fairly common. Um, it's a common congenital disorder. And remember we said that the base of the nasal cavity or the um, the floor of the nasal cavity is the same as the roof of the oral cavity. And there's those two bones that come together, right? So it's the palatine process of the maxilla and the palatine bone. And remember, they're paired bones and they join on the midline. So what happens is, is those halves of those bones fail to fuse in the middle. And so therefore you create an opening between the oral cavity and the nasal cavity. So this can be quite detrimental. Obviously there can be degrees of cleft palate, whereas you can just get um, some soft tissue in the lip, um, but you can have bony involvement where the bones actually don't come together. So most of the time you have to have surgical correction um, for this problem.
And then when we're talking about the spine, we talked about our normal curvatures of the spine. If anyone remembers our normal curvatures, we have some concave curvatures and some convex curvatures if you're looking at it posteriorly. But we do have some abnormal curvatures. So scoliosis is an abnormal lateral curvature. So the spine should be straight up and down if you're looking at it from the posterior side. It should not bend left to right. It curves front to back, right, but not left to right. Um, kyphosis is also known as a humpback or an exaggerated thoracic curvature. And that can happen with old age um, or certain disorders. And then lordosis is an accentuated lumbar curvature, such as um, with pregnant women can have a transient lordosis during pregnancy, and that's also called a swayback. You do see swayback in other animals, in four-legged animals, you can appreciate uh, lordosis. So how does the axial skeleton kind of develop through life? So the big thing about the skull in a newborn is that you have to allow for the brain, the nervous tissue to grow and develop. So those cranial bones don't actually fuse until later in development. And so, you know, you always hear careful with a baby's head because it's soft, right? And so what happens is is that uh, you have to allow for those cranial bones to grow outward and finally fuse. Okay, So they create these soft spots called fontanelles, and you guys are going to learn the individual fontanelles in the visible body, and you can uh, name them. Okay, So it's just where all these cranial bones come together. Okay. So what happens is they're unossified remnants of just a membrane, right? It starts as a membrane, and then we go through that intramembranous ossification of these skull bones. So that's what creates these soft baby skulls, and that's the areas that you want to be very careful with, okay? So as we age, oftentimes our um, vertebral column will compress. So you always hear, you know, your parents or your grandparents saying, well, I used to be 5'5", five, five, and now I'm 5'2", right? So that is true, right? So over time, essentially, you do lose some water content in those intervertebral discs that gelatinous um, nucleus pulposus will um, over time lose water and they will compress, right? So they're trying to resist all these compressive forces over the time. And even by just age 55, we've lost a few centimeters in height and that's very common. And obviously it increases as we age. But a couple other things is that our thorax becomes more rigid. So I said that xiphoid process does um, turn into bone, um, as well as just the whole thorax becomes more rigid and less pliable. And we also lose bone mass over uh, time with age, right? So um, we talked about osteoporosis in our previous lecture, but uh, just in general, um, our bones lose mass and it is uh, more common to break bones as we age. So here are our learning objectives. So you guys can make a uh, study guide for yourself to make sure you know all of these concepts. And next week we're going to finish the skeletal system uh, with the appendicular skeleton. Uh, we'll then talk about joints as well, and that'll be our final lecture of the unit. Um, but we'll finish the skeleton uh, next week with the appendicular skeleton. And here are some more uh, study questions if you guys want to take a look at the book. Um, you can take a look through those. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, otherwise, hopefully I'll see you guys in office hours. Thanks a lot.